Okay. I'm going to have USL members introduce yourself with uh, name, pronouns, affiliations. And so I'm Jackson Murphy, pronouns he, him, his, member of USL, president of uh, Korean Trans Club, um, member of Dismantling Systemic Racism Commission for the city of Langley, and a couple of other things I'll pass off to Maggie. Awesome. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, my name is Maggie Natris. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm affiliated with USL, uh, Social Justice Club, um, Queer and Trans Club. Uh, what else? Would be Climate Strike um, and probably a few others. Oh, yes. Uh, the Climate uh, Action uh, Committee with the City of Langley as well. And yeah, I'm glad to be here today. And I'm going to pass it over to Simone. Hi, I'm Simone. My pronouns are she, her, hers, um, and my affiliations are with USL. They're also with um, Social Justice Club and Ecology Club, and I will pass it on to Audrey. Hi, I'm Audrey. My pronouns are she, her. I'm affiliated with USL. I'm also a student representative on the Southby School Board um, and president of the Maldi United Nations Club at Southby High School. I'll pass it off to Derek. Hi folks, my name is Derek Koshiko. I use he, him pronouns. I'm affiliated with USL, E3 Washington, South Woodby Schools Foundation, on the Climate Crisis Action Committee with the City of Langley, and also an emerging zero waste group um, on South Woodby. So looking forward to that. Thank you everyone. Okay, if we could go to the next slide. Okay, this is just some webinar protocol. Um, we would like you to show your camera for at least a little bit of the time and keep uh, so that we can make sure you are who you are. And please try to keep your mic muted when you're not speaking as it just limits background noise. And as Maggie said at the beginning, please just put your name in front of the Zoom name. Um, and just protocol if there's disturbance, I just turn off your camera and feel free to leave if you're triggered. Um, and we can always, um, we will contact you after if you need that. Okay, this is just a quick recap of who we are. Um, we're USL, a student-led and organized organization focused on a range of social justice issues and fighting the climate crisis. And we started almost two and a half years ago with only two students um, and have done so much since then and moved away from just solely fighting the climate crisis as we started at the beginning um, of recognizing the intersectionality of all issues. And yeah, now we're much bigger two and a half years later. Okay. And past and future webinars, um, we are on the third series, or the third series in our series of three, I guess. Um, patriarchy webinar series and discrimination webinar series are both on YouTube, and they're both of a series of three. So there's now six of these on YouTube. Um, and this is the intro to the climate crisis webinar. And the next one will be the climate and politics globally and locally webinar, and then intersectionality of the climate crisis. And those will be um, climate politics will be on March 1st and intersectionality will be on March 15th. We're doing this webinar series to spread awareness about the climate crisis and how it affects our society and future. Um, and we hope that these webinars will help our community be aware of the climate crisis and ways to fight it. Okay, this is just a quick privilege check. We are discussing the climate crisis, um, as you know, and the climate crisis affects different people different ways. So just with patriarchy and discrimination webinars, just remember to check your privilege um, before you speak and try to work against any biases you may have um, when thinking about these topics, because even in the climate crisis, um, there is privilege and bias. Okay, next slide, and I'll pass it off to Simone. Thank you, Jackson. Um, so our, we just wanted to do a quick reflection before we start us off. Um, we were wondering what you guys would like to learn about the climate crisis in the future. So type your answers and we will let you know when to put in your or submit them in the chat. Just give a few minutes. Yeah, and we're going to do it uh, so that everyone type your uh, answer in the chat, but don't press enter um, until we do a countdown. Um, so we'll give everyone about um, a minute more um, to come up with your answer. And then um, again, if we all can press enter at the same time, uh, that we can do sort of a waterfall chat. Alrighty, Simone, do you wanna start the countdown? Um, yes, of course. Um, okay, uh, three, two, one, and everyone can start submitting their answers.
and I will read them out once we get a few. Okay. Best practices for communicating with lawmakers, legislators to affect change in regulations. Local actions we can do on a regular basis. How folks on Woodby Island are directly impacted by the climate crisis. I want to learn about the role of trees in our local community. Good one. I want to know what the students are feeling about the future. Good answers. Okay, I'll just wait 30 more seconds. And yeah. These are all great answers and I'm definitely seeing some things that we're going to be covering in this one, um, but also further in uh, future webinars as well. Alrighty. Um, I think, Simone, as soon as you're ready, we can move on. Um, so what is the climate crisis? Um, the climate crisis is a term to show a greater sense of emer emergency around climate change. Because the climate isn't just changing, it's causing a crisis. And if humans don't do something about it now, the consequences will be catastrophic. We have seen the impacts of the crisis through more frequent and intense drought, heat, storm waves, rising sea levels, etc. These problems lead a whole host of other problems. And the crisis is getting worse. And it's not just a change. It's a real problem. Uh, next slide. So uh, why we specifically use the term crisis is to show a greater like sense of urgency around the climate. Because like I said before, the earth isn't changing. It's in a crisis, it's an emergency. And the word is used to create a more urgent stigma. The definition of change is to make, make someone or something different, alter or modify. And the definition of crisis is a time when a difficult or important decision must be made. Crisis aligns more better with the definition we're trying to put out there. When species of animals are dying due to the climate, it's a crisis. And when kids have to walk out of school and protest for adults to finally pay attention, it is a crisis. Overall, the word crisis is a much better descriptor of how our climate, world, and society is shifting due to the climate. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'll pass it off to you, Maggie. Thank you, Simone. Um, and yeah, I think um, something that I'm just adding on to here that Simone mentioned briefly is kind of the effects that we're seeing um, because of the climate crisis. Um, so with some things that were mentioned were rising sea uh, levels, rising temperature, things like that, drought. And I think something that isn't kind of talked about enough is just how interconnected all of these things are. Uh, so just to start off, we have greenhouse gases. So CO2 is something that's talked about a lot in the climate crisis community and in climate change conversations. So that's carbon dioxide. Um, that's also methane um, and other just forms of greenhouse gases that help trap the heat um, in, of the sun in the earth, which leads to global warming. But that then leads to melting glaciers and that section melting glaciers then leads to the warming of our oceans um, and also the rising of our oceans. So that <laughs> warmth that our oceans are then taking in leads to more absorption of CO2 into our oceans because even just at a, a basic level, our oceans do take in CO2. Um, it's part of the way that the world kind of regulates the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere to begin with. But with the increase of See, uh, greenhouse gases due to human involvement, we're seeing a major increase in that absorption, which also leads to ocean acidification. And again, is tied to the warming of the oceans to begin with. Um, and then tying back into rising sea levels and oceans, that ties to uh, more water in the water cycle, and that causes increased water in our atmosphere, um, which again leads to those storms um, and changes in uh, local climate. So that could be uh, the major storm systems that we're seeing um, all along the coast of the U.S. right now, for example. Um, but it could also be local changes, such as uh, droughts and more floods. Forest fires, for example, is something that uh, is definitely affecting um, us on here on Whidbey because of, say, the smoke that we see uh, at least once a year. 
Um, and then all of those kind of local changes tie into loss of habitat, um, as does ocean acidification, uh, aquatic habitat, um, and aquatic animals dying off. Um, and all of that ties into loss of biodiversity, which is a major topic topping, talking about the climate crisis and uh, greenhouse gases and all of these things that are so very interconnected. So this is something that I could pull together really quickly to try to um, explain just how interconnected all these things are. There's a lot more connections that we will be hopefully talking about both in this webinar and in future webinars, but it's important to try to see the bigger picture of just how important and just how uh, critical it is to look into greenhouse gases and how we as humans can stop polluting them into the atmosphere because of all of these chain reactions down the line. Alrighty, so I'm going to go into the history of the climate crisis, um, but before I dive into that, um, just a quick heads up. The list that I have is not exhaustive. It is something that I pulled together based on a website that I will put in um, a little bit later when we have um, a questions section. And while it does have some major hard-hitting sections, I have not lived through these events, um, and I know there are some people here who have, so we're going to have a questions section if you do want to give any input on uh, kind of larger topics, then you're welcome to. It is also mostly based on the U.S., um, so there are definitely more events that are happening that are important um, that we will not be covering here, um, mostly because they don't relate to some of the things that I'm talking about later on. So if you are interested in the climate crisis, and you must be if you are here, um, it is good to look further into this crisis from a lens outside of the U.S. as well. Um, and then some important themes to uh, remember are increasing parts per million of CO2. Uh, so we start out, I start out around <laughs> the 1800s when we have about 290 parts per million. Um, and then in 2019, we have now increased to 415 parts per million of uh, CO2 in our atmosphere. And again, that ties back into what I just talked about, about greenhouse gases and those emissions. Also important that's not really mentioned in the history that I'll pull together is biodiversity loss. And this is happening all throughout kind of this history of the climate crisis, um, again, tied to these emissions um, and just something that needs to be uh, kept in mind and that we'll talk about in future webinars, hopefully. And then again, uh, the melting and breaking down of the global ice sheets and glaciers um, isn't talked about that much in here, but there are major events that uh, are seen as far as categorizing that um, throughout history. Um, but I just didn't have the space to talk about it in this one. Next slide. Alrighty, so basically starting out around the Industrial Revolution, uh, the first one specifically around coal, so major form of uh, CO2 emissions, railroads, land clearing, major deforestation, um, all of this is incredibly <laughs> tied to the climate crisis. And then we also have uh, the second kind of industrial revolution tied to fertilizers, chemicals, um, electricity, public health, um, also tied to uh, World War I and World War II. Uh, so nuclear power, things like that. And all of those kind of started this chain reaction that built over time um, and has gotten us to the point that we're at with the climate crisis. And then we also have um, a couple smaller events that aren't really that small, but they're not talked about maybe as much um, when it comes to the history of the climate crisis. Um, but we have the opening of the Texas and Persian Gulf oil fields in uh, 1920s. Um, and that kind of caused this major rush and boom um, around oil, which was a major uh, carbon dioxide uh, fueled greenhouse gas source. Um, and again, that's in the 1920s. And the first Earth Day, I thought kind of was important to mention, was only in uh, 1970. So again, this is a major time skip, and there's a lot of um, more nuanced information in this time. But just seeing the amount of change that has happened, um, starting around the 1800s and going all the way down uh, to 1970, when kind of the first major uh, countrywide pushes for climate uh, started up. I thought that was interesting to uh, pay attention to. Then we also have a uh, kind of oil embargo uh, energy crisis, which pushed some towards uh, other forms of energy. So that could be solar, that could be wind. Um, it could also be nuclear, things like that. And then tying that into a couple of reports that came out, specifically uh, speaking about how CO2 is going to lead to a 1.5 uh, or 1.4 degrees 
uh, rise in kind of the global temperature, um, which was released as early as uh, 1979, um, or as late, depending on, you know, again, tying back to how long ago uh, this chain of events started. Um, and then we also have the events of Chernobyl, uh, which slowed the use of nuclear energy um, as a form of clean energy, uh, trying to take us away from uh, fossil fuels. So that stopped being um, one of those resources that was uh, able to be used. Uh, and then we also have around the same time, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate and uh, on climate Change. So this panel has a couple different reports that I'm going to be talking Ah, that I'm going to be talking about down the line, um, specifically around the severeness of the climate crisis and trying to get uh, global action taken. Um, and then on the other end of that spectrum, um, instead of trying to get action taken, uh, we have the Global Climate Coalition, which was fossil fuel companies and other industries trying to slow down kind of the push for uh, climate legislation to be put in place, specifically to you know, up their profit and make certain that oil, coal, um, other fuels like that are still being used um, despite the impacts that they have on our crisis, on our climate in general. Um, and that also kind of ties into Reagan's uh, election in 1981. Um, that was another time when there was a lot of doubt cast on uh, the climate activist community and push for uh, the climate to be taken seriously. Next slide. Alrighty, and then going back to uh, that report, those reports I was going to talk about. Uh, so in 20, not even 20, in 200, 2001, uh, we had the first kind of report that the global warming was very likely um, and it and ended the debate kind of back and forth about whether or not the climate crisis was kind of human caused, but also, um, a problem that we needed to pay attention to. Um, and again, this is very recent. <laughs> I am 18 years old. I was born in 2003. Um, so this is only about, you know, two years before I was born. Um, and then we also have uh, the fourth report that the IC, uh, IPCC sent out uh, about the cost of reducing emissions being far less um, damaging than actually uh, continuing where we're at with emissions in general. Um, so instead of uh, using that argument of, okay, but if we, if we stop fossil fuels now, um, we're going to see a major damage to global economy, infrastructure, et cetera, um, kind of refocusing that as, okay, yes, but if we're continuing on this path and we're not stopping in time, um, then we're going to not have an earth anymore. So that was in 2007. So again, very recent, um, and also very important to acknowledge, especially as we're talking about the climate crisis down the line. And then we also have the Paris Climate Agreement um, in 2015. Again, this is a very recent event. Um, it was with a lot of uh, major uh, governments and uh, major countries basically saying that yes, they will uh, start taking action around the climate crisis or take major action towards it. Um, and not all the governments that were a part of this have followed through. Um, we've seen that recently um, with uh, the US, to be very frank, uh, 2016, we had a major pushback on whether or not we were actually taking action about the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and that is also tied into another report that the IPCC sent out um, around greenhouse gas emissions uh, needing to be in a sharp decline by 2030. Because again, it is 2022. Um, we have been saying this for years, but there needs to be action taken um, around the climate crisis. And that's part of the reason why we're here today. Um, and then also tying that in um, closer to home, uh, we have Greta Thunberg, um, which is, of course, outside of the U.S., um, but with her climate uh, Fridays for Future March that started um, in 2018 and then tied into United Student Leaders being formed um, and the actions that local uh, youth have been taken around the climate crisis. Um, so this is all, again, so interconnected. Um, and I think it's important just to recognize um, what we have and we'll continue to have um, what part we have and we'll continue to have uh, on the climate crisis and how we can continue to affect it in the future. But yeah, um, that is all for this slide. Um, and I think we have a question slide after this. Yeah. Um, so 
I know that there are a lot of climate activists here today, um, or even just people who are interested in learning more about the climate crisis and more of the things that USL is doing. Um, so again, waterfall chat, if you want to put in there, um, what did you do? Or when did you get involved rather um, in climate action? Um, so again, if you can type it in, in about like two minutes or so, um, I will start counting down um, and we'll just read out a couple different uh, connections that everyone has to the climate crisis. All righty, um, counting down. One, two, three, go. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna start reading through this a bit. Um, so we have involved since the first Earth Day um, or before uh, Earth Day, uh, 1970. Uh, 1990, working uh, by reading McKibben's The End of Nature. Uh, increased involvement since seeing in action. So around the uh, what, how, how do you even say? I think it's the 2000s. That's, that's the word. I'm showing my own age by not being able to say that. Um, 2000s. Um, but specifically kind of making your life around it in the uh, 2012. Uh, Tory, 2016, attending protests. Uh, involved since the 1970s. Um, uproot the system school walkout, which is awesome because USL organized that. So great to see you. And I know you've gotten way more involved since then. Um, educating, it educated at a young age, so hearing about it more and more, things like that. All of these are great. Thank you all for uh, sharing out. And yeah, I, I personally got involved um, because I was kind of raised into it. My parents were uh, concerned about the climate. Um, and so it had always been something that um, I had a passion for. And that was part of the reason why USL was founded because I wanted to make certain that youth could have a, um, a say in the climate crisis and kind of taking action and pushing for action. So, so glad to have you all here. Um, and glad that we span uh, generations of people taking uh, interest in it and making an impact. Simone, I'm going to pass it over to you. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so we are now going to move on to the interactive spheres. Um, different systems of the earth help sustain and cultivate life and everything in earth system can be placed into four major subsystems. Um, the inner workings and physics behind climate change are made up of four different interacting spheres. The first is hydro hydrosphere, which is all the water on earth's surface, such as lakes, seas, oceans. The next is the atmosphere, which is the gases surrounding the planets. Um, the next is geosphere, which is land. And biosphere is what contains Earth's living things. Um, next slide, please. So this is kind of a very brief picture of all the spheres in action interacting with each other. And I'm just going to do a few examples um, as of how they interact with each other. For example, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere connect because the evaporation from the hydrosphere provides cloud and rain formation in the atmosphere and the atmosphere brings back rainwater to the hydrosphere. Um, the geosphere and hydrosphere connect because water provides moisture for weathering and erosion to, in the geosphere and the geosphere provides a platform for ice melts and water bodies to flow back into the oceans. Another example is between the atmosphere and the geosphere. Um, with heat and energy needed for rock breakdown and erosions, that's how the atmosphere helps the geosphere and the geosphere in turn reflects the sun's energy back into the atmosphere. Um, one last one, um, the biosphere receives gas, heat and sunlight from the atmosphere. And in turn, um, it receives water from the hydrosphere and in a living medium from the geosphere. Or that was yeah, um, there are a lot more combinations and a lot more like sub spheres that kind of in like intertwine in these main spheres. Um, but that would be that would take too long. So this is just kind of a main um, brief summary. Um, next slide. OK, and now we are going to talk about the anthrosphere. The anthrosphere is the part of the environment that is made or modified by humans. 
Um, it was a term used by scientists separating humans into their own sphere for the huge impact that humans have had on the Earth's hydrosphere, biosphere, geosphere, and atmosphere. And one of the reasons why this is is because um, of evol or evolving over time, humans have had one of the biggest impacts on the Earth. And it kind of, scientists kind of shoved it into its own sphere because it interacts with all of the other spheres, as I will show on the next slide. So, um, yeah, the boundaries between the anthrosphere and the other environmental spheres have blurred and smeared due to both the evolutions and damages that we have done. Um, the geosphere the interaction from the anthrosphere to the geosphere is the use of land materials for farming and construction for civilization, such as building homes and roads and agriculture. Um, human interaction with the dynamic geosphere comes in the form of also surface erosion and excavations. Um, yeah. Um, the hydrosphere, the interaction between the anthrosphere and the hydrosphere is the input of nutrient and heat pollution and the excess removal of water. And one of the main ones from the anthrosphere, aka humans, interacting with the hydrosphere is the buildings and creations of dams and reservoirs. Um, yes. Um, and obviously with the atmosphere, the greenhouse gas effect has had a huge effect on the atmosphere. Humans activities are changing Earth's natural greenhouse gas effect. Burning fossil fuels like coal and oil can put more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. And the biosphere. Um, obviously, there's a lot of deforestation happening because of the anthrosphere. I would say that this is a big one because a lot of the damages that we as humans have done have greatly affected the biosphere. Um, melting ice caps, changing temperatures, burning of fossil fuels, not to mention um, different parts of life that we have um, affected. And of course the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, yeah, um, that's it. Next slide. Um, before we move on to the next topic, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat. And this can also uh, not just specifically be around uh, kind of what Simone talked about with the various systems and spheres of the earth, but also um, any major kind of actions um, or major events that you saw that you believe are tied into the climate crisis, um, which is kind of tying both questions into one. Um, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat and we will answer you. Um, I'm passing it on to Maggie or Jackson. Hey, I'm seeing a question from Joanna. At least the climate crisis is within the vocabulary generally. Do you see this as progress? Um, I think I see it as progress um, socially, um, kind of in our general culture um but that doesn't mean that it's progress against the crisis um if that makes sense maggie simone i think students yeah um, oh, go ahead. Maggie. <laughs> no you you go i will follow up okay um i obviously it's not the biggest significant change like physically but i think that it does create kind of a more stigma and more um more of an alert because personally for me when I say climate change it's I'm thinking about the change of the climate but when you're saying climate crisis it draws more attention to the urgency of climate crisis. Um, Maggie? Yeah no I, I definitely agree with both Jackson and Simone. Um, I think uh, there are still people who are pushing back, even within uh, kind of the climate action community, who are pushing back against the use of the term uh, climate crisis. I think that it's more widely used. Um, again, is incredibly important, is a good step towards um, taking action. It's part of the reason why um, climate emergency uh, declarations, for example, are so important. Um, it is adding in that kind of heightened sense of urgency. Um, but I also do think um, and agree with both Jackson and Simone that like it doesn't 
um, mean that kind of that struggle is over. Um, Because again, like we have people even within the activism community who are still pushing it uh, back against the use of that term because it seems seen as like too radical. Um, So if we can push for that to be used more often, um, then hopefully uh, we can see more change um, both around the climate crisis and uh, around how seriously it's taken in our world. Yeah, perfectly said, Maggie. Um, By the way, uh, I did put a link about why do we call it the climate crisis and a really good source by Climate Reality Project that I suggest that people check out. Thank you, Simone. And I am seeing a couple more questions. Um, Gary says, um, excellent, but what about the mining of fossil fuels like natural gas? Um, and yeah, I think that would be, if you're tying it into the spheres, um, then that would definitely be the anthrosphere, humans um, interacting with the geosphere, um, with our earth, like really negatively. If you're looking at more at the history aspect, um, then again, tying that back into like oil and the use of oil, um, and the energy crisis that kind of happened around that, um, it's really important to realize just how much we're using uh, natural gas in our everyday lives um, and just how much uh, we need to kind of pull back um, and push back against that use. Um, I think, Derek, you you might be part of um, a group that's specifically looking into uh, the use of natural gas in like Langley. I don't know if you want to talk to that at all. Yeah, just really briefly, um, the. The Climate Crisis Action Committee is currently drafting a climate action plan. And um, one of the actions being considered is to um, stop <clears throat> permitting uh, new fossil fuel infrastructure, and in particular, in particular um, the use of propane in new buildings, new homes. And Langley's kind of going through a growth spurt right now. And there's you know probably 140 new homes that are likely to be built in the next um, several years. So an important intervention right now and propane is not the same as natural gas um, but it's still a fossil fuel and it's still a gas and it basically is almost the exact same molecule it's just slightly different Um, it still results in carbon dioxide pollution it's still uh, mined using fracking technology yeah thank you derek and i'm seeing another question um, from tara if you could, could you share resources on ways to combat climbing, climate anxiety? Right. Um, actually, uh, Mary Jane uh, sent me a link um, to an article about climate anxiety. It might be the one that you're thinking of if you recently read about that. Um, but I will put that in the uh, chat if you're interested in looking at that. Um, but yeah, personally, at least for me, um, a lot of the ways that I can combat climate anxiety is by taking action. (laughs) And sometimes it doesn't seem like that's actually um, helpful because you can kind of get more overwhelmed with the things that you need to uh, do and things that need to get done. Um, But at the same time, especially if you're in um, spaces that are kind of like USL, um, you're around other people who are able to kind of joke around it and um, make light of the situation while also taking it seriously. I don't necessarily know if that makes sense, but basically if you frame it in a way as uh, we're taking action, um, we're gonna be talking about these really important events and we're gonna be pushing for our community to do better. Um, You can also frame it in the way of, I'm going to tie in my own humor. I'm going to have conversations that are really deep. I'm gonna connect human to human um, and be able to still kind of tackle the climate crisis while realizing that I'm not in control of everything and thus can't do everything um, that there is to do in the world, but I'm going to support others that are also taking action with me. Um, So that was a really long roundabout way of saying that you should definitely join USL if you're interested in joining, but yeah. Thank you, Maggie. Um, That's amazingly said. Um, Any other USL students want to add on? Okay. There was another resource around climate anxiety linked um, by Simone as well. Okay, and Sarah said, we as humans have known about the impacts on our climate, solutions have have been offered, but the political will to take action has been missing. 
now we're now we are in an extreme crisis. Individuals can do something, um, but worldwide worldwide systems need to be activated. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, I think that while USL isn't having like an impact on the global scale of climate change, I think we need to work both top down and bottom up. Um, and just what we're doing is raising awareness in our community and our community elects a representative. And so we're kind of having some impact on Congress, even just a little bit. Um, I think getting more climate minded people elected so that we can actually be working top down instead of just bottom up is really where um, it is. And that's just voting and not voting for people who are in the oil and fossil fuel industries um, pocket or are being paid by them or, you know. Um, yeah. USL students, anything to add on that? Um, yes. Um, first of all, Jackson, well said. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that when you said building from uh, the it's important to build from the top down from the bottom up was a good thing that you said because that is a big problem and also one thing that I think that evolving more into combating the climate crisis I think building smaller or building communities combating climate crisis within smaller communities like this for example USL and all the other things that have or all the small organizations I think that that is contributing hopefully to a bigger cause in the future. Um, yeah, Sarah, I really well said. That's just my two cents. Um, yeah. I was also seeing um, a question above that, talking about human overpopulation. Um, honestly, I think that's kind of tied into what we were talking about because um, of kind of the need for voting um, and need to have uh, people um, kind of take action and have a voice around this climate crisis. So that includes educating ourselves, educating others. Um, and there's only so much that we can do um, as the U.S. continues to grow, as other countries continue to grow. Um, and I think it's incredibly important that uh, kind of voting rights um, and things like that are tied into the climate crisis. And that's actually honestly going to tie into what Jackson's talking about later on around intersectionality. Um, there are definitely things that we can do to impact the crisis outside of just um, educating ourselves or just doing the small things ourselves, but also those small actions lead to larger overall steps towards uh, changing this crisis. So there are a couple more questions, um, but I, actually I'm only seeing one really. Um, so I'm gonna answer that real quick and then we are going to move on because we're taking up a lot, a lot of time for this section. Um, let me find it real quick. Um, how viable would nuclear energy be uh, with how long it takes to construct a new nuclear plant? Um, personally, I am not an expert on that, so I do not know. Um, however, Derek is raising his hand currently, and I'm going to pass it over to him. I mean, I don't want to step on U.S. all toes if someone else wanted to cover it, but I, I'll go for it. Um, the There's a benchmark called the Lazard Cost of Energy, LCOE, and or the levelized cost of energy and the um, Lazard Institute puts that out, basically talks about the cost per megawatt, megawatt to build any kind of power. And um, solar and wind um, and fracked gas are the lowest cost of energy right now. Solar and wind is slightly cheaper than gas and coal is actually higher at this point. Um, all those are around five to 10, 12, um, is it dollars per megawatt? And um, nukes, nuclear power, nuclear fission power is like four, 30 to $40 per megawatt. So like, why would anyone even build that um, when the cost is, you know, five to 10 times higher and it cost, takes like 10 to 20 years to build? Um, so that's just that. And then um, from a social justice standpoint, the impacts on indigenous people, and the fact that you're creating pollution that cannot be mitigated ever, um, or at least not in a time scale relevant to um, civilization and humanity. Um, there are supposedly new systems that are um, smaller and supposedly 
less toxic and easier to get created. And uh, they're called modular, small scale modular reactors. And those might be worth looking into. Um, and there are at least two companies in Washington state looking into those. Um, so something that if someone was interested in exploring, you could look into or campaign for or against. Um, and then there's also um, nuclear fusion, which is different than fission. Fission is what you break apart atoms and create um, pollution, but also energy. Fusion is a lot cleaner and safer, but um, hasn't really been uh, super practical yet. Um, there's been some pretty amazing advances in the last couple of years. Check. Yeah, thank you for that, Derek. Um, and yeah, tying back into kind of the history that we were talking about earlier, like there's Chernobyl, for example, there's that large impact of um, that type of energy. And that was kind of one of the reasons why we started focusing on different energy outside of nuclear um, power. Um, so while it could be um, something we're going to do in the future, um, supporting things like solar um, and wind and maybe hydropower, hydropower is controversial right now, um, could then have benefits down the line outside of nuclear. Um, but honestly, at this point, anything but fossil fuels is at least at least a little bit better. So it ties into, honestly, it ties into um, kind of that ethnic, ethical um, dilemma around how we're dealing with the climate crisis. Um, and honestly, that ties into Jackson's next kind of section around intersectionality in the climate crisis. Um, so looking into kind of the impacts that we take um, to affect climate change and change uh, kind of this crisis that is happening. Um, but also the effects that this crisis is having on human beings um, and what we need to kind of look into uh, deeper. So honestly, Jackson, I'm going to hand it off to you so we can wrap up this segment um, and start moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, and everyone, please look in the chat for all of the other comments and great resources. Um, and if you hit the three dots next to your chat thing, you can save the chat if you want to have like all of it, but do that at the end so that you have everything. Let's do another questions section and then the end. So, yeah. Okay. So this is intersectionality of the climate crisis. Um, this is just kind of an intro to the intersectionality of the climate crisis as we do up the third webinar is all about this. Um, but I think it's one of the most non known about parts of the climate action movement. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so just a refresher on exactly what intersectionality is. It's recognizing this, that systems of power and oppression do not operate independently and separately from one another um, and centering the voices of people whose social identities overlap to create compounding experiences of discrimination. Um, and some may think that this is not applicable to the climate crisis, but systems of discrimination cause the unequal effect of the climate crisis on marginalized communities. Um, and we can't stop the climate crisis without an intersectional approach. Um, and we've run um, into this um, from supporters who don't see the connection and, and the overlap um, between these two um, issues. Next slide, please. Okay, and this brings us to the concept of environmental just justice. Um, and this is the fair and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, and that is kind of a dense definition, um, but it really kind of encompasses everything. Um, and this kind of sub-movement in the environmental movement understands the intersectionality of the climate crisis. Um, and others in the environmental movement do not understand this and think that the climate crisis is, only, is the only issue that matters. Um, and they're missing that the only way to stop the crime, climate crisis is to dismantle the system of discrimination and colon, colonization that created it. Um, because we need to solve the climate crisis for all peoples and not just white, cis, straight men, people. So uh, just also taking into account system discrimination when talking about the gun crisis. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now we're just gonna do um, a reflection before I get into more specifics of um, how the climate crisis affects different groups. 
Um, and so we're going to do another waterfall chat. So we're going to take like a minute to type it in and then we'll send them and read them out. Um, so what are some examples of environmental justice issues that you can think of just like off the top of your head? Okay, so we'll take a minute to think about this. Okay, so three, two, one, send. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mary Jane said, uh, okay, li lithium mining on Native American sacred land, Thatcher Pass, for example, local dirty energy facilities in lo lower income communities, the Snake River dams, storm issues in New Orleans predominantly affecting POC and poor neighborhoods every hurricane season, places lower income groups can afford are often near waste factories, pollution sources, uranium mining in indigenous communities. Um, Gary says environmental injustice involving BIPOC communities and, and industry, water contamination, how it disproportionately affects lower income folks, um, and creating policy for green building without out making it affordable for all. Thank you all for putting those in. Okay, and feel free to put more in if you um, haven't already. Um, and next slide, please. Okay, so this is race and the climate crisis. Um, so environmental racism is racism that causes communities of color to be disproportionately burdened with health, hazard, ooh, health hazards through policies and practices. As a result, these communities suffer greater rates of health problems um, attendant on hazardous pollutants. And examples of this would, of environmental racism would be um, Flint, Michigan. Um, for example, and I'm sure most of you have heard of this, and in Flint, Michigan is a predominantly Black community, um, and the city government failed to properly treat the water and ignored complaints of foul smelling and discolored water, um, of hair loss and skin rashes. Um, and after this crisis, uh, the Michigan Civil Rights Commission concluded that this slow official reaction was a result of systemic racism. Um, so this is not just speculation, this is what the state says. Um, another um, example of this would be LA County, California. And in LA, California, Black and Latin people are more likely to be hospitalized with asthma and white people than white people, sorry, um, due to their community's proximity to health hazards. Um, and the last example I'll be, that I'll be talking about is the Isles de San Charles, Louisiana. Um, and out of the Isles de San Charles, uh, Louisiana, our nation's experienced its first climate refugees. Um, oil and logging activities, um, along with sea level rise, eroded away much of these islands. Um, these islands were the ancestral lands of the Biliox Chichimacha Chakota tribe, um, and they have now are in the process of relocating um, because their islands are no longer livable. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, so this is a really interesting graphic that I um, thought really encompassed environmental racism. Um, and this is pollution exposure by population. Um, so Latinx Americans are, are 63 more exposed to 63% more pollution than they produce. And Black Americans, it's um, 56%. And white Americans are exposed to 70% less pollution than they produce. Um, so it's kind of just like the location of communities because of systemic reasons. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is patriarchy in the climate crisis. Okay, so cl uh, climate feminism um, is a feminist who approach to the climate, climate justice. And th that means to address the issue of climate change is a complex social issue, um, but also through an intersectional analysis. Um, and that challenges unequal power relations based on gender and other characteristics. Um, and this type of analysis advocates for strategies that address the root causes of inequality, 
transform power relations and promote women's rights. And women are, because of the patriarchy and its tools, disproportionately, disrep oh gosh, disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. Um, and 80% of those displaced by the crisis are women. Um, and women have higher rates of homelessness, poverty, sexual violence, and disease than men in response to the climate crisis. Um, and, at it, and men created and perpetuated the climate crisis as we still live in a very, very patriarchal society controlled mainly by men. And it, is, it was worse um, when this crisis was beginning. And so at its core, the climate crisis came to be because of systems of colon colonization, slavery, and capitalism created by men profit over people. And men still have a bigger carbon footprint by women by 16%. And the top 1%, which is overwhelmingly men, has a bigger car carbon footprint than the bottom 50%. And so because of the patriarchal ideas of our society, men have a bigger impact, but are less impacted by the, by the crisis. Um, and next slide, please. Okay, so this is impacts on the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and because of the community's marginalized status, they are also disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. Um, and LGBTQIA plus people collectively have a poverty rate of 21.6%, um, while the rate for cis straight people is 50.7%. Um, and this leaves homeless Korean trans people more open to the elements and at a greater risk to be displaced and killed by the climate crisis. Um, and so the main impact is that Korean trans people have a higher rate of homelessness. And so they are more likely to be killed and die in climate crisis and also have lowered mobility because of lack of money, um, because of other systemic impacts. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is classism and the climate crisis. Um, so people who have more wealth um, can move easier. So, okay, restarting. Class is a contributing factor in how someone is um, affected by the climate crisis and people who have more wealth can move easier and already live on more desirable land, less impacted by the crisis. Um, and people who have more wealth can also recover from natural disasters and disasters caused by the climate crisis more quickly than those less privileged, as um, I mentioned, or someone else mentioned in Louisiana, especially New Orleans with hurricanes recently. Um, and the other part is that those with less wealth cannot um, follow the most sustainable practices, um, that those with more wealth can, um, by like not buying plastic and by electric cars, etc. And I feel like um, a lot of like, society this idea is like do what you can and i feel like we're kind of like guilting those who ha are less fortunate because they can't because survival is over trying to be sustainable um so yeah and next slide please okay this is disability and the climate crisis. Um, people with a disability are, are, are often just reportedly affected by the climate crisis, just like I've said about all of these other groups. Um, and extreme weather events, um, which is one of the factors driving increased migration in recent years, um, affects them more because they have uh, less of an ability to migrate um, because of their immobility. And people with disabilities might be unable to travel and buy be forced to remain in degraded environments without housing, employment, support networks, or healthcare services. Um, and while disabled people are disproportionately affected, they do not have fair representation in climate conversations due to ableism. Um, so yeah. And the UN has said that um, disabled people are in the top three groups most that will be most affected by the climate crisis in the future. And now. Okay. Now I just wanted to have um, a little bit of time to uh, have people ask questions specifically about the intersectionality of the climate crisis. Um, I just went over a ton. Um, so if we could just take like a minute breather. Okay, uh, I think um, we can get into this, these questions um, and please feel free to just 
unmute um, and talk, but just be respectful of everyone's speaking time um, so we can make this more of a discussion. Jerry, I see that your hand is raised. Well, yeah, that was quite, uh, so far, the whole thing, very impressive, I must say. Uh, but that section you just went through uh, about intersectionality uh, was very powerful. And uh, it would be useful in talking to people about this to have the numbers uh, that you just uh, um, shared with us. Uh, I wonder if you could do that email and uh, document, which includes those, those critical numbers. And I might also yep. add that uh, uh, regarding CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, 350. There's a reason 350.org is called 350.org. Do you know why? Anybody? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Okay. Well, Bill McKibben asked uh, James Hansen about this so that he could put a number on uh, to the level at which we shouldn't uh, go beyond. And that number is 350 parts per million. And hence, 350.org was born to try and drill that into people's consciousness. Didn't work. <laughs> That's good to know. And uh, I would have, to, I will organize my notes because right now they're a little scattered. Um, but I could send it a document with those statistics. Um, and I will also, um, in a follow-up email to this webinar, I'll include all the resources um, and pages that um, I have around all this information. Uh, I think and we're, we all will do that. Um, and I did see a question in the chat from Rich. What actions does USL plan to take in the near future? Um, we are currently working on having the county pass a climate emergency declaration um, and Sid and Tori are heading that campaign. Um, and we are hopefully going to do another climate um, protest strikey thing um, soon to um, try to push that. Um, and yeah. Strikey thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that'll be taking place uh, March 25th. Um, so there's going to be an action that USL will hopefully be organizing around then um, that's tying into the global uh, actions that are going to be taken. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, March 25th, um, there's going to be global actions, even if USL decides somehow not to organize around that. But we will we will be hopefully putting something together. Then. Um, and we also have, of, of course, the upcoming webinars, um, which we at the very least see as forms of actions uh, being taken to educate our community. So if you want to come to the next one, again, uh, that's March 1st, I believe. And then the last one, I believe, is going to be on March 15th, um, same time as this one, also on a Tuesday. Um, so yeah, those are great places for you all to join too. Um, and Rich, I and Carol, I do see your hand raised, but I do think we have one more question in the chat. So I'll come back to you in like one second. Um, Shannon did say, what are uh, some of the best ways, uh, best learning formats uh, slash processes or curriculum to teach about intersectionality and in the climate crisis? Um, personally, for me, <laughs> I'm currently in an environmental science class that United Student Leaders can got added into the school curriculum at South Liberty High School, so I'd be able to further answer your question probably in about a couple of months. Um, but the way so far that's being framed for us at the very least is that um, our teacher is basically entering it under environmental justice. So as we're going into climate change as a whole, um, we're also talking about the effects of um, climate and how it is it kind of basically what Jackson just did, kind of talking about the various uh, forms at which people are affected by the climate crisis. Um, so far she's tied in like reproductive uh, rights, for example, um, and uh, women's rights into it. Um, and also uh, racial justice, again, the disproportionate effect at which uh, people of color are affected um, by the climate crisis as well. So 
it it probably depends on what level of learning you're looking at for high schoolers it's a lot easier to kind of be really direct about that um I'd say for younger students it's easier to um kind of talk about it maybe more indirectly um show various books or examples of it uh teach to it in uh, like asking people to look up resources and dive deeper into their own learning as well. Um, maybe report back to the class about what they've learned because um, there will be people who focus maybe more specifically on their own um, identities and how they're impacted by the climate crisis. Um, but I don't know, Jackson, if you have any. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. I think you said that really great. Um... What I have to say is a little bit off topic and it's something I forgot to share. Um, but I also wanted to like talk about how like environmental justice is not like a new idea. The term environmental racism coined in 1982 um, and uh, environmental feminism and environmental justice were coined around that same time. Um, so pretty early in the um, climate action like movement. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Sorry, it was kind of off topic, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks, Jackson. Um, something else that I thought of too is like, I've been raised here on Woodby Island, right? Um, and part of the reason why I've loved, uh, I guess, taking action and been so passionate about the climate crisis is because um, of kind of the world around us. Um, and something, again, that our teacher <laughs> mentioned was that, um, by being around nature and by being in nature, you're more likely to kind of understand and connect with it and also fight for the climate because you're surrounded by, you know, the climate around you, you're surrounded by the nature around you. And so um, I think a good way to kind of tie into just the climate crisis in general, um, which is a good kind of segue into intersectionality um, is to get people out in nature and have talks about the climate and nature as well. I don't know. If anyone has any more specific thoughts around that too. I think Derek added in a couple of things as well. And who had their hand raised before we? Carolyn and Rich, I think. Okay, muted. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think you guys may know, Rich and I publish a, a monthly progressive on Whidbey newsletter. And I think it would be really nice if the USL could provide us with something every month that was, you know, where you want to wake people up or where you want to have them know about what you're doing or, you know, however you want to do it. We can, you know, we'd be glad to include something in the newsletter regularly. It goes out to about 450 people. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, is Tori still on? Tori's still on. Um, we have, I think, another uh, newsletter that we're also communicating with and trying to get some updates there. So we might um, maybe copy you all um, on an email like that that goes out. Um, we can definitely look into that more. And if you want to respond to USL's like latest newsletter um, and bug us about that again, then that would be great. So I will actually remember <laughs> after this webinar is over. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for offering. And if you could um, private message us um, your email um, so we could follow up, that'd be great. Okay. I think that's basically it for questions. And everyone, again, just be sure to um, put in your, um, uh, read the chat, sorry, <laughs> because there's other things in there that are not questions that are valuable. Gary? Yeah, Gary. yeah uh, responding to something Grant said in the chat regarding melting ice, and um, he thought he read something about it being a con contributing factor to uh, the release of greenhouse gases. I was not aware of that and thought that maybe he said he'd recently read a book um, 
So maybe Grant could tell us more about that. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, this was like a year ago. I was reading a lot on environmental, like political environmental issues. And I came across this one novel. Well, it wasn't a novel, it was like a book. You know, it was an article, more of, uh, essentially detailing this self perpetuate and loop and how like we kickstarted this climate crisis. And now that all of these like carbon holding icebergs, you know, the glaciers, Antarctica as a whole, uh, these carbon sinks are melting and it's just releasing more carbon into the air and how this will just result in the atmosphere warming more and, you know, melt more, you know, carbon sinks and how it just would continue building up. And like, this was a while ago, so I don't remember any numbers or anything. And I never really like fact checked the book or anything. So I was just wondering if like anybody knew anything about this. Yeah, so that that ties back into the um, kind of diagram that I showed closer to the beginning of how like all of this is a, a self perpetuating system, um, and yeah, I think that's that's really interesting that you read about that too. Um, yeah, something that has been talked about recently, at least in um, our classroom, has been uh, the fact that um, it's kind of the the world wants to write itself it wants to it has these like checks in place to make certain that we don't stray too far from like the norm the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for example um so things like the ocean um take in heat and they take in uh carbon dioxide and they try to regulate that overall fluctuation um but the amount that the earth is kind of changing the amount of carbon dioxide that has been released into the atmosphere, the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that have been released into the atmosphere are kind of throwing off of those systems. So instead of the ice reforming and taking in some carbon dioxide or taking in some of those greenhouse gases, we are now having it melt at an exponential rate and now having more gases released into the atmosphere. We are having ocean acidification because of the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that is being taken in by the ocean. Um, we are seeing sea levels rise because the water that used to keep our planet at a normal temperature is now taking in so much heat that it's actually warming to an extent where it's melting the glaciers more and not refreezing. So like all of these various systems that are supposed to keep our planet in check are doing the opposite and making kind of the overall situation worse. Um, and so I do think that's, that's a really cool thing that you read. Um, and again, something that isn't talked about enough. And thank you, Derek, for adding that in the chat. Yeah, I think Derek uh, helped clarify this because I think it's more the permafrost and the, meth the methane uh, trapped in the permafrost and being released to the war from the methane uh, crystals in the bottom of the very shallow Arctic Sea, which is losing its ice cover. But it's not the ice itself that is um, contributing significant amounts of greenhouse gases. Methane, you know, is 20 times, more than 20 times more uh, powerful a greenhouse gas than CO2 in the long run, but 86 times more uh, impactful yeah, over 20 years. And the oceans um, are rising primarily because of heating, because when things heat, they expand. And with the melting of the ice sheets, not the glaciers, not the icebergs, but the ice sheets that we find in Antarctica and um, Greenland primarily. So just to clarify things a little bit. Is there any other questions? And yes, keep up with the chat, everyone. Just a last reminder. Okay, next slide, please, Derek. Uh, 
Okay, um, so these are just some calls to action at the end of this one. Um, so please promote this webinar series to friendly young friends. Um, we have two more, um, one in two weeks, which is climate pol politics locally and globally. Um, and then four weeks from now, so exactly a month from now, we have um, intersectionality in the climate crisis. And just share um, what you've learned with the people around you um, and spread this knowledge so we can do something and keep working up and maybe even start working down um, and just hold each other accountable with like the information you've learned specifically around um, intersectionality. Um, and if you work in climate groups that aren't aware of the intersectional um, like aspects of the climate crisis, um, I think education on that. So again, share what you've learned. Um, yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Um, if you want to be added to our email list, um, you can put your email um, in the chat um, to privately to one of us if you don't want it to be shared publicly um, in this meeting. Um, and we will add you to that. Um, and these are our social medias, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And on YouTube are all the other webinars that we've already done. So if you want to catch up on discrimination webinars or patriarchy webinars, um, please do that. And thank you all for being here.